Progress Party of the Norwegian Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, my question is uh, directed at the, um, at the Afghan uh, representative. Uh, recently, there was a Shia law passed by the Afghan parliament that would severely affect the Shia women minority. Uh, what are your comments on that law? Was it passed? Uh, was its influence reduced? And what could you say that the law maybe affected the Shia minority in a negative way? Thank you. Uh, well, that law was uh, not based on human rights standards. It was a discriminatory law, a violent law against women. Uh, it was violating the human rights uh, and women's rights standards. And it was against um, the values of our constitution, uh, constitutional values for women's rights and human rights in Afghanistan. Also, it was against all those values and principles of international conventions that Afghanistan has signed and ratified to that. So it was not um, something to be accepted. But as you know that uh, the religious society um, or political parties, they are um, very powerful inside Afghanistan and they are sharing political power. So uh, that law was created based on that powerful foundation and was passed through that powerful channels. And uh, this is an evident that we can see how much the extremism is sharing the political power of Afghanistan. Within one month, that kind of law is getting created, drafted, and then processed, and then uh, signed by the president. But you can, you can compare now that when I was Minister for Women's Affairs in 2005, I drafted the uh, for the first time in Afghanistan history, uh, the law for uh, elimination of violence against women. By the time that I was out of the ministry, within one year I was in the ministry, and six months acting minister. So uh, it finished, the draft was finished and was sent to Ministry of Justice. Because the parliament was not at that time formed when I was minister, I couldn't take it to the par parliament. By the time I was out, the parliament came. So it was in the Ministry of Justice to be sent to the parliament. It took four years. It was not processed. So you can imagine now the combination, real combination of Afghanistan government, how much discriminatory the uh, substance of this government and violence against women's rights and human rights is, that it was not getting processed, it was stuck, it was not going through, but the other law that you heard about it, it was drafted and processed and signed within one month. So that uh, vices against uh, that law that internationally got increased and a pressure uh, from international community was brought on Afghan government because of that discriminatory law or Shia law. So that made it possible for the stuck law of for uh, elimination of violence against women to be starting moving and getting through and getting signed. Because when the international community, when the Shia law got signed, and um, the international community start pressurizing the government of Afghanistan, we from civil society started reminding the international community that there is another law that is getting stuck and it's not getting processed because that the, the law for elimination, for viol, uh, elimination of violence against women in Afghanistan is based on human rights standards, so that may, made an opportunity for this law to get uh, through. So that is why, of course, that law is, was not acceptable and it got uh, stopped. I mean, to some extent, many articles got changed, and, uh, but it's still it's problematic and uh, it is not uh, acceptable by women's rights activists and human rights uh, organizations and activists, but uh, it is there still, yeah, with some corrections. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Faisal Fulad, the Secretary General of the Bahrain Human Rights Watch Society. If you could raise your hand. Get the floor. Thank you. My, uh, actually, my question to Professor Kotler how globalization affects the women's rights in the world? Thank you.
when we speak of, of uh, globalization, um, it is not only a, an economic uh, term. Uh, globalization has also uh, found expression in what might be called the globalization of, of law, the globalization of rights, the globalization of communications uh, through the internet and the like, the globalization of civil society, of the interconnected involvement of uh, NGOs in, in an international uh, sense, the globalization of advocacy. So when we look at it, I think the, the important thing is the dynamics of the globalization revolution in the manner of rights uh, protection, uh, in the manner of uh, civil society uh, engagement, uh, and those, and in the manner of the use of uh, the communications uh, strategies, all that, in my view, have been uh, a resource that have actually helped to promote and protect women's rights uh, to uh, equality and to protect against violence against uh, women. For example, I was discussing the uh, various anniversaries that we are uh, commemorating and meeting today, the 100th anniversary, as I said, of the International uh, Women's Day and 15th anniversary of Beijing. But another, and this is part of the phenomenon of the globalization of rights and globalization of empowerment for women. It's the 10th anniversary now of the UN Security Council Resolution uh, 1325 of the year 2000. That marked the first time that the UN Security Council formally recognize the uh, disparate and prejudicial uh, impact of, of conflict uh, on women and, and children, and therefore the need with respect to include women in all forms of uh, decision making with respect to conflict uh, resolution. And just last week, a whole uh, initiative has been taken at the UN with uh, Mary Robinson, among others, at its head with regard to engaging uh, women in the peacemaking and peace building and conflict resolution and the like. All this is part of uh, the, I would say, the dynamic face of, of globalization that inures to the benefit of women. However, on the, uh, and this may have been in part uh, your question, if not inspired your question, when we're talking about the dynamics uh, economically of, of globalization, uh, some of that have actually, uh, in, in fact, increased the disparities of wealth and power uh, that I spoke and uh, actually increased uh, gender uh, uh, inequality in, in that regard in terms of uh, incidences of, of poverty, the feminization of poverty and the like. So I think to sum it up, I would say that we need to, uh, in fact, draw upon those uh, globalizing dynamics in terms of uh, rights, uh, protection, legal enhancement, etc., uh, to which I was referring to address and redress the adverse side of globalization in terms of its economic uh, fallout and its prejudicial fallout uh, for women, uh, both with respect to women's empowerment and, in fact, in terms of the manner in which it impacts uh, on women's disadvantaged situation. I'm going to go to Nicola Lazzari. If you raise your hand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> this is a question for Madam Jalal, actually. It's regarding uh, Afghanistan as a nation. Uh, many of us might know that in the region specifically, it's actually governed very tribally. And a lot of these tribes have their own laws, which are not very enforced by the governments. My question to you really is do you believe that maybe in the near future these laws can possibly actually be reformed for gender equality? And a further generalized question, is Afghanistan ever really going to be able to be governed by one government under one law, which hopefully we can one day pray will be gender equal? Thank you. Excuse me, your specific question is? Is regarding the many tribal laws that exist around Afghanistan and whether those one day may be reformed, whether nationally or locally, to be able to be more gender equal? Of course, we have the Constitution now. We had constitutions before, too. I mean, uh, 
from uh, 1964, we have a democratic, uh, we had a democratic constitution, which is called in Afghanistan history, the decade of democracy. And uh, afterwards, then we had the communist uh, governments. And after the international community came to Afghanistan, so we have the constitution of Afghanistan based on democratic principles, principles and based on human rights uh, standards. And uh, within the frame of the constitution of Afghanistan, all other laws are getting modified, reformed, and by now, many of the other laws have got corrected based on gender equality principles and other human rights standards. That's an achievement to Afghanistan people and to the new democracy that we have, young democracy that we have in Afghanistan. The tribal, the tribal law that we have, or traditional laws that we have that are getting practiced in villages, and um, the government power uh, are not so much powerful in the villages, uh, four provinces of Afghanistan. That is because of insecurity, and that is because of the um, Taliban fighting in the provinces, and that is because of the government is very new, is not extended so much powerfully to that areas. So as much as the government is getting powerful, and uh, the, the, the law, the, the law, the national law that we have will be practiced. And as much as it's getting practiced, that much democratic, democratic uh, government and society we will have. The traditional law is not that much strong in Afghanistan. Where there is no, no government in Afghanistan, then we have such uh, laws getting practiced. But where we have the government, the new laws within the constitution of Afghanistan frame is getting practice. So the traditional law is affecting people's life, of course, very much. But it is not that much powerful to stand against the new laws uh, which is created by the government of Afghanistan. Uh, if we work hard in Afghanistan, we can bring the rule of law in Afghanistan very strongly. And the traditional laws, these old uh, ways of uh, uh, living and thinking will be replaced soon. But if we work hard and we have enough resources to, to work on it, so that, and that will not be a problem. I am optimistic in this regard. And Thank the Taliban problem. The Taliban problem that are, they are thinking right now, and they talked about it in London, just uh, some time ago, one month ago, uh, in the conference, and they have another conference in Kabul for implementation of, the, of what they decided in London for, um, for solving the Taliban issue. So if Taliban problem is over, so that's another big success to Afghanistan empowerment for the close future. Thank you. Our next question comes from Edward Mortimer, who is the Vice President of the Salzburg Seminar. He's also the former Director of Communications for United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I really ask this question more in, as a citizen of the European Union. I was very interested to hear what uh, Mrs. Jalal said about the attitude of Afghan women to the burqa, particularly in rural areas, and uh, the need for uh, a gradual process of changing attitudes. And I wonder if she has any advice for European governments, uh, many of which are agitated at the moment about this question of the burqa, of, um, m women from communities originating in Muslim countries uh, who appear in public and sometimes with quite young girls also wearing the burqa. And there are proposals in some countries to outlaw this. Uh, and would she see that as being a constructive way uh, of advancing or protecting women's rights in Europe or, or not? Thank you. Well, uh, as I said in uh, my speech that uh, burqa is getting decreased in urban areas day by day. It's not uh, getting practiced anymore by women who didn't have burqa before, before Taliban. When Taliban gone and they right away took away their uh, burqas, it was not getting practiced by the um, educated women before too, before Taliban. 
and now educated women are not using it anymore. And uh, in the rural areas, uh, women are not using it on daily basis. When they work on the farms, uh, they don't use it. And they never used it before too. But uh, if they travel to cities for protection, they use it for security and uh, use it as a habit. And in the beginning, 100 years ago, when burqa was brought from India as a fashion, and they use it, they w used to use it as a fashion before. So it will be gradually uh, die down, of course. And the new relations uh, will, will be placed, um, uh, the old relations uh, will be replaced by the new ones. We are creating new values, new principles. We have now rule of law in the country and we are hopeful for uh, expanding this to the rural areas and um, by that time, I mean, everything will be changed. And, and the internet and uh, the, t the TVs, I mean, the, that uh, has connected us to the world, it, it brings very quick change in the culture of Afghanistan, I'm sure. I mean, already I can see a lot of changes in the mind of the children in the villages who has access to TVs. And um, so, uh, radios, TVs, I mean, Afghanistan is not getting open to the world. And of course, uh, they will share their new values and new ways of thinking of the age of democracy in the world, of the age of technology. I'm sure they are human beings too, and they will be connected to the world soon. But we need to help them. We need to give them the equipment. We need to help them to be empowered. Thank you. But my question was actually about Europe and um, whether you think it is advisable for European governments to outlaw the burqa, uh, as some of them are considering doing. I think uh, Europe is uh, uh, a, a land of liberation and democracy, and uh, let it be free. Yeah, and that that is better for uh, liberation and democracy. We learned from you nations to live free. So practice your free and liberal practices that you had before for solving your problems. As much as pressure, you know that, that you bring on human being or communities, that much resistance will be created. So why to create that resistance which is not needed? Let it be free, whatever they choose. Yeah, that is, that is the best, I think. And that is working for, uh, if we study and research the human history, that formula or prescription has worked all the time for solving the problems. Why to create conflict? Why to create isolation? Let it be free. And let them to decide for themselves if they are individuals or groups. It's better, it's cheaper. It is, yes, it's cheaper, it's better, it is, um, from many angles, if you can look at it, psychologically or uh, sociologically, and from many angles, it is the best way to leave it be free. <laughs> Professor Cutler. Well, I just want to say in just a quick response uh, to uh, Mr. Mortimer that it's not only a European issue, it's not right now a Canadian issue. Uh, as well as, as we meet, the matter is before the courts in Canada uh, because there have been attempts uh, to ban uh, the burqa and Muslim women and, and indeed educated Muslim women have, some, are, have argued also that this is a matter of freedom of religion, this is a matter of expression of, of uh, their identity and uh, choice and that this is something that should not only be permitted but protected in, for example, a multicultural society like Canada, whereby we are one of the few societies in the world where multiculturalism is a constitutional norm. In other words, it's a protective framework for the protection of plural identities. Uh, there are others who are arguing, and uh, you know the other uh, side of, of, of the argument, which have brought up even security concerns, electoral concerns, how do you do this? And, in, in terms of uh, an, an election, there have been complaints within the school system and the like. Uh, I, I think what uh, Dr. Jalal has been, uh, I, I think, trying to in, invite us is to uh, let the matter uh, evolve in, in terms of, of dialogue and, and, and choice and a certain uh, respect for plural identity. And I think uh, rather than trying to resolve it uh, through the 
uh, approach of, of uh, prohibitions in the legal system. Thank you. Uh, Regina Ruiz, I, on your question I think was maybe dealt with. I don't know if you still have. Yes, I, I'll, um, first of all, being, being the first um, female um, uh, uh, to ask a question, I would, like to, <laughs> I would like to greet all of the women present at this hall and all those in the building of the International Center of Geneva for our, our day, the 8th of March. In Italy, at the moment, different cities are, are distributing the flowers, the, the mimosa yellow flower, in, in, in the streets to remind especially the men that this is International Women's Day and the women themselves who are not aware of this. And also, Italian women say we wish that Women's Day will not only be on the 8th of March, but 365 days a year. Um, my question would be to my co-woman on, on the panel. Um, Italy, as you know, is, has a very recent um, immigration history. Immigration began in the 80s. And at the moment, we'll also have to speak of the girls, not only the women, because there's the problem of the Shador. And um, a lot of girls in schools are actually obliged, we're speaking of freedom, are actually obliged to put on their shador by their parents. Um, or else the principal of the school decides that there should be no shador. Hmm? Another problem be, would be for older women when they have to go to get their permit to stay and have their picture taken for the, for the police. Um, the police say you have to remove your shador and these women say we can't. And so we have also done the question as uni, the uni, uni Media Association together with, with the other labor unions and associations, how come the nuns, the Catholic nuns, don't have to remove their, their veils when they have their, their picture for, for the police? And so the, the, these were the two questions. The two girls, the, the, the young girls, do they have the freedom to decide and tell their parents, mom, dad, I don't want to put on the shador? And uh, as you may have heard very recently, um, um, a, a young girl has been killed by her father because she had, um, she decided to go and live in with her Italian boyfriend. So, what are the answers to these questions? Well, we have to protect uh, the freedom of people, of human being. This much uh, advancement that our world uh, has by now is through that freedom of minds that started to get practice in the world, yeah? Democratic uh, countries practice that. And uh, we have to promote uh, freedom and protect it. Human being is born free, yeah? And, and need to be free, not under pressure. Um, he or she has to decide for herself or for himself. And uh, the governments, uh, has the responsibility to provide that context of freedom and liberty for the citizens. Children should be protected from the pressure from the parents and the families. Of course, we all want this. I mean, this is the way. And um, the children, I mean, um, and the parents uh, living in these countries, I mean, they live in another law and uh, other society, and they have to observe the rules and the procedures, principles of the society, and they have to get on, I mean, find ways to get on, especially when you give the example of police, and the order and security, safety is very important, is the vital uh, area of life. They have to be cooperative with police for, since police responsibility is to bring security and order. And all citizens have to be cooperative with police forces. They have to be cooperative, and they should understand that. But, but, but the question is that nuns are not obliged to remove their veil. Yeah, and but those who have the chador have to remove their well, chador. Well, discrimination and injustice are the cause of many wars in human history. Discrimination is bad. There shouldn't be, shouldn't be any discriminative laws because it brings hatred. It brings um, not understanding each other. It brings a lot of psychological complexities. And uh, it, 
It brings distance between human beings, individuals, and groups, between people and the government. Discriminatory law is not good, I and mean, we all know that. I mean, if it is a law, I mean, it should be the same for everybody. I mean, discrimination of, we struggle against discrimination in Afghanistan of many kind we have in Afghanistan. And in any society, I mean, discrimination is not good. It brings problems. It brings, the output is conflicts, problems. So that's why, I mean, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't believe in discriminatory laws. I mean, governments are to protect their citizens on an equal basis, democratic governments, of course. And, uh, and if it is dictatorship, then the case is uh, not like this. So the democratic governments, uh, main actual substance is justice. Justice. And, and, Just, and, and yeah. briefly, does the government have to educate the parents about the new sure, society? Sure, there are many ways for communication. Many, many different techniques for communication, they can use it, yeah. To live together in order and in safety, and happily together in a community, yeah, in a society. There are many ways that they can, they can find out how to communicate. It's a problem of communication, and they can solve it, yeah. Political intention, so if there is no any political intention, so that can be solved. No problem. Thank you. We'll now go to our last question, and then I'll ask if any of the panelists uh, have a final concluding words uh, before we conclude. Uh, Diego Sharifker, he's the leader of the Venezuelan student opposition movement. Uh, Diego, if you could raise your hand. Uh, if you're still here. Voila, please. Oh, thank you. And the question goes to both members of the panel. Do you think of establishing a fixed quota in parliaments, for example, that a fixed number of the parliamentarians have to be women, does that fight discrimination or just accepts the fact that it exists and that women don't have possibilities to reach those place, uh, spots in the parliament without this law? Or maybe you want to answer first. Uh, should we have a fixed quota of women in parliament? I don't, uh, I'm not in favor of fixed quotas, though I am certainly in, in favor, as I mentioned, of uh, the movement that we have in Canada called Equal Voice to bring about, you know, equal representation of men and women in Parliament. One of the ways uh, that we are seeking to encourage it, for example, um, in terms of our own party, the Liberal Party, is we have set in here, if you will, a quota within the party that at least one third of our candidates uh, that stand for uh, election must be women. In other words, the party has, a, has to have a floor that one-third of the candidates would be women. This is also brought up, uh, you know, as, as some women have pointed out, yeah, but are you putting uh, the, the women, when you do select them as candidates, in areas that they can't win so that the one-third uh, is not as, re, uh, you know, as, as effective as it might appear if the women are not given an equal chance, if you will, or equitable chance, to win the riding. So it's not only that we need to set a floor for the number of candidates who will be women, but also to in ensure that women have an equitable opportunity uh, to uh, be uh, candidates in, in ridings where they have an opportunity to win. It shouldn't just be a situation where we can say, yeah, we've one third of our candidates are women, but a number of those, or even a significant number of those candidates have no chance uh, of winning in, in the ridings in, in which they have been put uh, forward. So I think we need to, as I say, Norway did move. It moved from 15% representation in the 70s to 40% uh, representation uh, by setting floors, uh, by um, providing mandated number of candidates to be presented for elections and the like. And I think what, uh, while I'm not against quotas, I'm certainly in, in favor of parties having to establish floors for the minimum number of women candidates that will be presented at the election. Well, uh, the gender equality policy final destination is to distribute the decision-making power and wealth between men and women on equal basis. To reach that, we have many different mechanisms and techniques based on different societies, different ways. 
One of the techniques is the equal participation of men and women in all levels of power. For instance, in Parliament, now to reach the equal participation of men and women, uh, we started with positive discrimination to facilitate women coming to the Parliament. Once it, it is done, this is fulfilled, so there is no need in the future. I mean, they will have, the, the women will have that power of coming by their own power to the Parliament once they are powerful enough. But since now, as Professor said, that in the world, 10%, more than 50% of uh, the global um, population are women, but only 10% of the wealth or resources of the world is in access of women. So you see the, the difference, how uh, the, the difference is very big. The gap is very, very big. So to fill this gap, to empower women, to enable them to be able to get their rights and stand on their rights, and uh, we need to push them, to support them. So that's why positive discrimination policy or affirmative action policies are put in the laws in different countries where it's needed to push women, to empower women, to facilitate, to pave the way for them to go through and to get to their position where it is given to them. So that's why. Just one uh, very brief uh, concluding remark, uh, in fact, in terms of where I began. When we celebrate uh, International uh, Women's Day, as I said, we recall the, the clarion call uh, that women's rights are human rights and there are no uh, human rights which does not include the rights of women. But that must not only be a matter of rhetoric. It has to be a priority on our national and international agenda as a matter of principle and policy. So until we move to actually give expression uh, to it in our laws, in our principles, in our policies, in our implementation, uh, regrettably, it will remain the inspiring uh, rhetoric uh, of the Vienna Conference on Human Rights and uh, the Beijing Platform of Action, but it will not be a reality in the, in the lives lived by women themselves. So I think that must be our objective. Uh, to bring about a transformative reality in what is an inspiring rhetoric. And a, a concluding remark, uh, please, by uh, Dr. Jalal. Well, at the end, I want to say that uh, Afghan since you know Afghanistan women's situation before, and right now a bit, I mean, they are a bit revived, but uh, as you know that the combination of Afghanistan government is not consist of Democrats and liberals, the leadership. And uh, Taliban is going to, to be coming to share the political power too. And we had other extremist uh, political parties already sharing the political power due to the peace and security reasons that they were giving. So it is further risks for human rights activism in Afghanistan. So I call upon the international community to further support the human rights activism in Afghanistan, women's rights activists, and uh, the women's rights agenda in Afghanistan. And do not forget Afghanistan women and uh, human rights issue in the country, since another big risk is coming uh, through the Taliban engagement with the political power of Afghanistan. So thank you for your attention. And with that, I want to thank both of our distinguished speakers for helping us pay tribute to International Women's Day and the right to equality. Uh, here at the United Nations, we also have the right to food. And uh, it being at 12.15, uh, we'll now break for lunch and we will return at 1.30 for the panel on authoritarianism and dissent. Don't miss it. And lunch is also a chance for networking for all of you human rights activists here. So uh, bon appetit. Thank you. <laughs>